Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Tierra Curry. I'm a senior scientist in our Saving Life on Earth campaign. And we're excited to bring you this speaker series webinar to learn more about the many ways we're working to end extinction. We have a very special program today about the San Pedro River, which is a Southwest jewel. I've been there once and it was incredibly amazing. So I'm jealous of all of our speakers who are there a lot more often. There's been a lot of good news since our last Saving Life on Earth webinar. And one of the exciting things is the executive order to protect 30% of US lands and waters for wildlife by 2030. This is so exciting because it's gonna go far in the fight to end extinction because you can't save endangered plants and animals without saving their homes. And the San Pedro River is one of the best examples I can think of and of just an incredibly important place that supports so much wildlife. The story of this river, which is under threat, is the story of so many rivers across the US and the world. The San Pedro is important in and of itself and for all of the incredible plants and animals that live there year round, but also because it's vital migratory habitat for so many animals across the West and then some. And all of our guests tonight are working to save this special place. So I'm gonna turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Dina, do you wanna start? Sure. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Dina Kagan. I'm the producer and director of the film and I'm really happy all of you could join today. I'm really excited to share with you about um, the river and the film. Um, I just wanna say I discovered the St. Pedro River when I moved here to Arizona from New York City. And I was blown away by its beauty, but also I was really surprised to see water and grass and trees and uh, beautiful bird fish in the middle of the desert. And um, I learned then just how important this river is and also how vulnerable. And so I'm really happy all of you are here. Thank you. Thanks, Dina. Robin, do you want to go next? Or Ralph or Michael? There we go. It's, oh, it's there you go. Sign of the, sign of the times. Um, I'll start with an anecdote in that my father grew up in, in the ghettos of Pittsburgh. And after his service in the, in the army, he said that he would never camp again, ever in his life. And I took him to the San Pedro one time and he looked around and he said, my God, I didn't know there was so many different colored birds. He camped again and he camped on the San Pedro. That's a wonderful story. Um, did you tell us who you are and your role at the center? Robin is actually one of the center's founders. I am. <laughs> um, there's there's four of us and we started, uh, we got together um, many decades ago. The San Pedro has been one of the issues that I had been working on uh, prior to the center. And in fact, the organization that I primarily represent in those days, uh, Maricopa Audubon, was responsible for stopping the dam uh, that uh, had it been successful would have flooded the entire upper San Pedro into Mexico. It was part of the Central Arizona project. Um, and now the torch has been passed and here we are. Thanks Robin. Michael, you wanna go next? You're on mute. I've been uh, hiking the river for the last uh, 50 years, and um, I live in Bisbee and work in Sierra Vista, so I drive it across it every day. I've done that for about 35 years, and um, I've been a volunteer for the Friends of the San Pedro River, and uh, I lost track of about 5,000 hours. I think I have 10,000. I uh, have been doing a video um, uh, project where we have the San Pedro River educational series. And so we created those for the schools and I continue to do work. We're doing the beaver surveys <clears throat> and we just um, completed the beaver survey this year. And we found that the beavers are up this year from last year. Last year, they were about 12 and this year, we think they're about 15. The highest number we had was about a hundred and 
the beavers were reintroduced in 1999 and their numbers have fluctuated. And there are a whole, there's a whole big story about uh, times of good uh, precipitation and bad precipitation uh, resulting in the changing numbers of beaver. And I have found, um, <laughs> I found some very interesting things which perhaps I'll talk about later. Okay, yay, ecosystem engineers are always happy to hear that. And last but not least, Ralph, introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Ralph Walt. I am a naturalist and an author. Uh, I've only lived on the river for about 20 years, but um, right now I'm sitting in a home just a quarter mile away from the San Pedro in the Middle Valley, north of Benson. Uh, this is a really, really amazing part of the world here. And this river and its watershed are something that is just incredible. Uh, I've I've lived in the American West ever since I was an eight-year-old child, and I've spent my, my life um, studying the natural world and roaming all over the West. And based on everything I've seen in all my travels, this is one of those places that is just beyond precious. It's incredibly rich with a real diversity of life, and it's also under great threat right now. Do you wanna put in a little plug for your book? Sure, I could do that. Um, I just published this book. I don't know if you can see it. It's called The Life of the San Pedro River. It's a naturalist's account of the river and its watershed. And it is a book that is uh, unique. It's, I don't think anything like this has ever been written on the San Pedro uh, before. And I hope a lot of folks read it because I wrote this book for just two purposes. And the first one, was to help protect this place. And I dearly hope it can do that and, and help in that effort. Um, the other reason I wrote this was to help educate all of its readers about the place and why it is so worth preserving. Thanks, Ralph. It's You're truly an welcome. honor to, to be on here with you all. If you haven't watched the film yet, the link is gonna be live through the 31st. So you can watch it right after the webinar or later this weekend and right now Dina's going to show us the film trailer. The developer chose a theme of replicating Tuscany. This is Tuscany. This is the land where the development would take place. Does this look like Tuscany? The San Pedro River is a very exceptional part of the Sonoran Desert. It's full of animals that you don't see in the dry part of the desert around it. It is just a biological treasure. A little over 900 species of birds have been recorded all across the North American continent. Remarkably enough, within the San Pedro watershed, there are 400 plus of those bird species represented. What this development is planning on doing is almost doubling the population of the San Pedro Valley. When you put that kind of population density in an area that's in the middle of the desert, with this fragile river running through it, you're going to have serious impacts. Thanks, Dina. So if you haven't watched the film yet, there's a little preview of what you're going to see. Um, Dina, let's talk about, about your film. What inspired you to make this? Well, um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, three or four years ago, I completed my first film about the San Pedro River, um, which was about the development called Sanzia, which was going to bring, as they claimed, renewable energy from New Mexico to California by building these humongous electrical towers and dividing the wilderness with roads um, in the San Pedro Valley. And unfortunately it got greenlit. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but it's greenlit. And after I was done with that, I learned about um, this 28,000 home development that will bring um, 70,000 people 
uh, very close to the river and it would kill it and it would kill it very fast. And um, so I, I decided to, I, I wanted to do a film about that because I can, you know, I've been making films for 20 years and it's, it's a skill, it's a gift and I wanted to put it to use. And, you know, there's so many things that happen in the world you can't do anything about, but this is something I felt I can, it was felt very empowering. So I watched, uh, for inspiration, I watched uh, the video that the developers made for, um, to attract their customers. And you can see it um, if you go to the screening um, page where you watch the film, it has a Q and A and it says, who is Vignetto, what is Vignetto? So you can see it there. And what it is, is a compilation of stock footage, which is just images you can buy online of really happy people kind of retiring age, um, playing golf and having wine and in really green um, grasses and Tuscany images and um, really no images of what the land looks like, the Sonoran Desert, uh, where the river runs, um, none of it. So, uh, um, it, it, you know, and it's presented as an act one, the freedom of uh, action, act two, uh, the possibilities. And so I kind of did a little bit of a spoof of that, you know, act one, you know, water, act two, the desert, you know, river, desert river. It's um, just, I really wanted to kind of answer that video and say, this is how things really are here. And um, so that's, that's the inspiration. And then um, really to help people understand why, okay, so but we're not on the river, we're in the desert to help people understand why this would be detrimental to, the, to this unique habitat, um, I had to make, I had to understand myself first and then help people understand how the desert river functions. And so we did some um, animations, um, things like that. Um, and my hope was that it's simple enough for a child to understand. Um, and um, uh, one thing I wanna say is that um, you know, when I watched their video, I thought if I'm somewhere from the north or from Canada, uh, north of the US or Canada, I, I could maybe buy this, you know, if I don't educate myself a lot. And um, so I'm really happy to see that a lot of you asked you to put your zip code when you signed up. That was me. And I wanted to see where you're from. So I'm really happy to see people from Alaska and Canada and Pennsylvania, um, because the potential buyers would be from those areas. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm just really happy the word is getting around uh, about this river and about this potential development, which I hope stops. Thanks, Dina. People are always asking me, how can I help save plants and animals? How can I help the environment? And the answer is do what you're good at and passionate about. And for you, like it was filmmaking. And so you made this film. That's awesome. Um, let's Thanks. go over to Ralph. Ralph, tell us why the San Pedro River is such a special place in terms of like biological and cultural resources. Um, that, that would be hard to say in just a few sentences, but I'll, I'll... I'll give a little bit of a, of a glance at it. Um, one of the things that makes this such a special place in terms of its flora and fauna is the fact that there are these major ecoregions that overlap here. And what I mean by that is um, we have animals, for example, that are native to the Rocky Mountains. And those animals have a certain range in North America. And that range extends all the way down to this valley where we have certain representatives of flora and fauna from that Rocky Mountain ecoregion. There's also uh, flora and fauna from uh, the Northern Sierra Madres in Mexico that reaches its Northern limit in this part of Arizona. And then there's, um, there's flora and fauna from the Chihuahuan Desert and the Sonoran Desert that also overlap right here. So this is really an incredible place where we get all these different um, representatives from these big ecoregions overlapping and living together in one small part of, of America. Uh, in terms of the cultural resources, um, I'm not an expert at this, I'm no archeologist, 
but uh, one thing I know is that um, there is a nearly continuous record of human presence in this watershed and along this river that dates back to well over 10,000 years ago. Uh, there are a few places in North America where such a continuous record of human presence has been documented. And not only that, but there's just an amazing abundance of sites all up and down the river and throughout the watershed that represent a real rich diversity of cultures, different peoples at different times in history. So that, that's a little bit, um, good God, in terms of what lives here, uh, well, you could write a book about it, which I did, but um, uh, you know, there, there's 90 mammals that are living within this watershed right now. And I don't know of any other similar sized inland area anywhere in North America that has that kind of richness. Um, there's 80 uh, reptiles and amphibians living down here in this little corner of Southeastern Arizona. And in terms of, of that sort of fauna, um, uh, that's a really, really high number that is exceeded only in one or two other places in all of the United States. And we've, we've already mentioned the birds, the, this place is a mecca for bird watchers. Uh, it's famous with people not only all around the United States, but it's known to people all over the world. They come here to bird to, to enjoy the beauty of the place. Um, well over 400 species have been recorded in the, in the watershed here. That's an amazing figure for an inland area in, in the United States, really any, any area in the United States. I hope that when people start asking questions, they ask you more about the wildlife. I wanna ask you about the butterflies, just a, a heads up. Um, so Robin Silver, you've been trying to save the San Pedro longer than I have been alive. And Vignetto is just one of the threats. So tell us about, like, give us a brief overview of the campaigns that you're working on to save this river. No one has saved a desert river in the West. And so just so to kind of get perspective of where we are, um, no one has ever saved a desert river uh, that's been under such siege for so long with still a chance of success. And that's where we are now. So um, we've, we've uh, hit on Big Neto. The effects of Big Neto, which is up um, a little bit to the north of, the, of, uh, of another one of the big threats, um, is dangerous not just because of the local area where Vignetta will be, but just like everywhere else in the West, um, that will result in sprawl. And if you look at some of the other desirable places that people move to in Arizona, let's take for example, Sedona. When there's a development of a place called Sedona, which is famous for red rocks, it's not just about the 5,000 people moving to Sedona, it's about the 7,000 people that are going to need to service the 5,000 people that are living in Sedona, and that's what's going to happen. So this is massive sprawl in a place that it, that place that cannot sustain it. The biggest water user in the basin is the United States Army. That's the biggest single user, and uh, at last count, um, we have litigated against the Army. I think we're now, uh, the total is 10 because two are active. We've won eight. And that's been among our biggest challenges to try to control just the, the use of water that is a result of our tax dollars being spent to kill a national treasure. You just think about that. We have laws in place that are supposed to prevent that from happening just like we have laws in place that are supposed to prevent Big Neto from happening. And that's the battle that's, that still goes on. Um, we've been relatively successful to date. The current lawsuit against uh, Fort Huachuca, which is the army base, uh, will also end up in a win column for us. But more importantly, we need to get control of the unsustainable groundwater pumping 
that is threatening the river. I would encourage everybody, Dana did an, or Dana did an incredible job of helping illustrate the connection between the groundwater pumping and our desert rivers, because that's what's happening to our desert rivers is people don't just divert the water right out of the streams. They put a well that into the aquifer that supplies the water during the dry times of the year when the water from the aquifer seeps out of the banks. And that's the danger. So uh, she did an incredible job at illustrating it. And that is the challenge that we still face because in Arizona, there is no law that prevents someone from putting a well next to a stream and sucking the stream dry. In fact, in Arizona, under Arizona law, that's encouraged. But fortunately, we have federal laws that prevent that when there's federal interests and the San Pedro belongs to all of us across the country and throughout the world. And we'll count on those laws to continue to protect the San Pedro. Thanks, Robin. So let's turn to Michael. I'm so jealous you spend so much time on the river. Um, what do you love about it? Just tell us about your love for the river. Uh oh, you're still on mute. <laughs> I, uh, as I said, I lived in Bisbee and I worked in Sierra Vista. And on the weekends, uh, I would go down to the river and walk for 12 hours. And it just kind of evened me out. I'm from the Midwest and I'm accustomed to rivers and trees and you know, between the Rio Grande and the um, Colorado River, this is really the only substantial river. I think there's a Pecos in there, but the San Pedro is just a very special place. And I could feel that I was uh, still in the, in the Midwest, even though I was in the middle of this immense desert. Uh, it's this ribbon of green. Uh, it uh, is not very wide but it draws all the animals and it's a great corridor for bird migration. And it's a vital step when you think about birds that leave from uh, Mexico and head up north, they have to stop someplace to get a drink and to get something to eat. And if that river dries up, then those birds are gonna be awfully hungry and awfully thirsty and they may not make it. And then on their return trip back down to Mexico in the winter, it's there. So I'd hike and I've seen all kinds of cool things out there. Um, I hike out there every weekend. And uh, one day I was listening to the radio and I heard one of the county commissioners saying, oh, well, we don't have to worry about the San Pedro. It's good for 300 years. And I thought, well, how does he know? And um, so I set out to walk the river from the border up to St. David in the Sprinka. And I took my video camera and I filmed every 100 yards. I set it up and I filmed. And this was in the month of June, our hottest month. And I filmed and I, I have it all. And if anybody ever needs that, please get a hold of me because it took a long time to do. Believe me, it was pretty hot up there. <laughs> and so I can show you what the San Pedro River really looks like. Uh, and, and that's in June. You know, the San Pedro fluctuates a lot. But if you see it in June, I think most people would be shocked. Um, you know, when I walk the river, uh, like I said, I walk about 12 hours each day. And in that time, I get like 30 seconds, I mean, three seconds of, of a good shot. But I would take those shots back and compose these videos for the school kids because I worked in the schools. And I thought it was really important for the kids to see what was down there because a lot of them don't get out. They can take some field trips. But I thought, you know, you really can't save a place unless you see what's there. So I got a big kick since I worked at the school and I was a technician, I could make these videos and show them on the screens. And um, <clears throat> we have a creature down here called the Quadamundi or the Quadi to be precise. And uh, I showed a video and this young man came up to me um, <clears throat> on the campus and he says, my mother says that they can hunt Kawadi. And I said, well, that's right. And he says, I don't think that's good. And I thought, right on little dude, <laughs> good for you. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad this made a difference and that you saw something down there that you thought was uh, worth preserving. Another thing I've done is I uh, filmed some indigenous folks. There's a guy, uh, Joe Joaquin, a Tahana Otham elder who recently passed away. And one of the things he said was, 
to the Autumn who lived along the river, uh, that respect is a, is a big word. And um, I've spent a ton of time down there making these videos, doing the beaver survey, doing the wet dry monitoring. And I like to respect the land and to give back to it. And unfortunately, I think there are um, a lot of forces that just wanna come and take from the river. And unfortunately, higher up in the Bureau of Land Management, um, some arms get twisted and they ignore the people who are down here spending all this time, the 10,000 hours working. And they go in favor of hunters and uh, the ranchers and they just kind of blow us off. And that changes depending on, you know, administrations um, and whoever's in the BLM. But uh, I really want it to be a place where we are concerned with the wildlife and the health of the environment. Um, I have a garden and when you grow a garden, you see how the ecosystem functions. And I think it's so important. If you wanna to begin to understand rivers and the health, the ecosystem of a river, grow a garden and begin to see uh, what things are needed. Anyways, I could go on, but um, that's what I have to say. Thanks, Mike. I want I have one more question for Dina and then we'll turn to the public questions. You guys are, are typing in. You know what, what's next for you now that you've made this film? What's your next project? Um, I'm working on three projects. Uh, one is a fiction script that's um, about patriarchy militarization. It's about two women. One lives in Bisbee and one lives in Mexico and crosses the border. Um, the other one is an idea um, that I would like, I would like to do something in Chaco Canyon, which is like the Machu Picchu of the North American. Hardly nobody, hardly anybody knows about it. Um, and because, because of that, it's, it's, it's vulnerable to development around it. And um, as soon as this COVID thing ends, I would like to take a trip to New Mexico and film some. And um, the third one is uh, another film about the San Pedro River, which may be my last one. And it's, um, it's, it's um, kind of a bird's eye view of the river. It's, it's gonna talk about its beauty and importance. And also, um, like you mentioned here, uh, uh, this river faces pretty much all the same issues that other rivers in the world, which is overpopulation um, topped off by encroaching developments and climate change. Um, we have a unique problem of the border wall, which hopefully will stop. Um, and um, what I also want to do with this film is not make it overly factual, but make it a bit like a poem. So include songs and anecdotes and poetry by the people who live um, in the valley. So that's coming next. That sounds really beautiful. I'm going to turn to the questions people are typing in. Robin Silver, I think this first one might be for you. What is the status of the lawsuit filed in 2019 and has the court done anything to halt construction? The, the lawsuit that we filed in 2019 is based on uh, um, two things. Most importantly is the fact that the army covered up a report uh, that uh, the finding, they covered up the findings of a report. They, they named the report in their documents, but until we secured a copy, we didn't know what was in it. And the report was covered up by the army because it said that they were 300,000 acre feet in the hole to start. And that the damage that was coming from the pumping that was attributable purely to Fort Huachuca started damaging the river in 2003 and that it wouldn't peak until 2050. So the lawsuit is now grinding through its process as the army tries to continue to hide these facts and to not include them. The second fact that we learned was is this is the, the seat of our, this is the intelligence school for our intelligence officers. And so guess what they learn how to do there? They learn how to manipulate people. And what they did is they were manipulating the Fish and Wildlife Service scientists to the point that they were getting water credits 
for water that had the use of which had been retired a decade earlier. And to make matters worse, after they manipulated the Fish and Wildlife Service biologists, there's a paper trail that shows them congratulating them to themselves. Well, that's what's going on in the court right now as they try to not show all these things to the judge. Eventually the judge will see it and eventually the judge will be offended. As I said, this is lawsuit number 10, I believe. Um, uh, and, and the judge will rule in our favor and they'll have to do another evaluation. Only this time, there's no escaping the facts. And the facts are that Fort Huachuca has to downsize. It has to downsize dramatically because they're the biggest water user and they're the biggest threat to killing the river. That's what will result from the lawsuit. It's inevitable, we'll win, and it'll take us probably about another nine months to a year for that to be official. So that's, that the, that's the Fort Huachuca suit, but is there a suit, uh, is there already a suit about Vigneto and water rights? Yes, the, the, uh, the Vigneto suit is also grinding through the, uh, the legal gears and uh, the issue that is grinding through the gears there is, is that during the Trump administration, uh, the, the, uh, uh, one of the Trump soldiers, a fellow named Bernhardt, forced a change in a decision that was made by a Fish and Wildlife Service official uh, that was not fair. And so that's there, we're fighting over whether or not that becomes part of the record. The bottom line is, is, is that unless the laws are changed, you can't go in and put a development that's going to result in a massive modification and destruction of desert washes and the areas that drain into a river without mitigation. And for Vigneto, there is no mitigation. So ultimately, as the lawsuit plays out, uh, I, it, it, it again will, will you know, the, the developer really doesn't have a chance to win. Under the Trump administration, they tried to change some of those laws that protect uh, the desert washes and the other, other parts of the uplands in the desert that are so valuable uh, to, the, uh, to desert streams. But the bottom line here is, is that if they're successful in developing this community, it'll suck dry the northern part of the National Conservation Area. Um, and that's that, that in a word is called theft, because the water that it will suck in their wells belongs to us as American citizens. It doesn't belong to a developer just because you're rich. And that ultimately will be stopped. Thanks, Robin. There's some, sort of some very specific questions about Vigneto. Um, what does the word mean? And what's the schedule for the project? And are they already selling plots? Dina or Robin, do you, whoever wants to take it. I can just answer about the Vigneto. It's entered in the film. So Vigneto in Italian means vineyard. The other questions I think are for Robin. Okay. I don't know that they're selling plots, but if they were, that would be what we call out here as selling land that doesn't have water. That would be speculative. So can people help by contacting their senators or representatives? Are there any champions in Congress who love the San Pedro and would be willing to help save it? There will be a couple things that are gonna be coming up. Um, no matter where you live, however, is, is there are attempts to change what's called the Clean Water Act to try to make it so it's easier for people to blade uh, desert habitat and destroy desert streams. So wherever you live, you can make sure that your legislatures are aware that that has a supreme price. And, and whatever you do, please don't listen to the Republicans that come from Arizona because they're liars. Um, so you can, uh, you, you, that's something they can do. In the longer term, um, there will be um, efforts to try to not downsize Fort Huachuca, and there will be efforts to try to steal water by the Vigneto developers, and that'll be stopped again by congressional actions as well as legal actions. 
So I would say at this point, in terms of something specific to do, um, I would say just please stand by and please check frequently. Um, there's a, a website that I think was attached to the link to this film, right, Jira? Yeah, savethesanpedro.org. Um, and please stay tuned, and I guarantee you that we'll have things that are going to be incredibly important for you to do. So in terms of the whole watershed and trying to get more protection, like how much of the watershed is in public lands, and would it be possible to get more protected land in the watershed? Um, I presume that's for me, correct? Um, in this watershed, um, one of the issues that we have is, is that most of the groundwater pumping, in fact, essentially all of the groundwater pumping that's not a result from military activities is happening on private lands. And that's one of the big battles in the West because uh, as I said, in Arizona, it's legal to put a well next to a stream and kill it. And so um, we need to revise laws that, are, uh, that promote that kind of activities. Uh, but in this case, what's public lands is, uh, um, is the San Pedro River. That's a public land. It's uh, a, a treasure for us. It's a treasure for the world. And if you have a private lands well that's next to the San Pedro River, that doesn't give you a right to kill the San Pedro River. And that's what we're going to need to continue to address. So the short answer to you is off the lands that are designated as national conservation area lands. Um, those are essentially private lands that can't be uh, controlled in terms of their water use and, and until we get into a much more desperate situation. We're not there yet. You can tell that we've turned all our members and supporters into policy wonks because all of these questions are like policy and legal questions. So that's great that you guys are like so informed on the process. Um, people are asking about specific federal permits that are needed in terms of NEPA or other federal agency permits that could help stop this. Well, there's two. Uh, let's divide this into, into two because Vigneto is somewhat separate um, in the permitting process from Fort Huachuca. So Vigneto needs to be permitted under the Clean Water Act. And that's where one of the battles is, is, uh, is, is that uh, they can't get a permit under the Clean Water Act if the Clean Water Act is, is obeyed. And the reason is, is because it, it requires that you provide mitigation for the riparian, the river, or the federal properties that you're destroying. There is no mitigation for the destruction that Vignetto will bring. With respect to the, uh, the area that's closer to the Mexican border, uh, that's about the Endangered Species Act. Endangered species on the San Pedro include the yellow-billed cuckoo, the southwestern willow flycatcher, the uh, Huachuca water umble, soon to be Arizona ringo. We need it for recovery for the, the northern Mexican garter snake, loach minnow, spike dace, desert pupfish. You get an idea, uh, the, the richness that we describe in terms of the bird life, the mammal life, the reptilian life, or the invertebrate life, it's reflected by some of the, the rarer species that are protected. And that's why we keep winning every lawsuit that we file because we as Americans want to save, we don't want to cause extinctions. And if we allow the military to continue on their current course, they will kill these species that we've protected as endangered and consequently they're at risk and that's why they will continue to lose their lawsuits. If we do away with our belief as Americans in Noah's Ark, then they'll succeed. Uh, I don't think we will. The, the concept of Noah's Ark and preserving other life forms is too valuable to us as Americans and I don't think the army is ever going to prevail. And our long-term well-being depends on the diversity of life around us. So I wanna, um, somebody ask a question about the wall. Dina, you mentioned that earlier, the effects of the border wall on the river. Do you wanna just touch on that briefly? Um, I, I think um, one of the other three people will probably be more informed. I'm yet 
to be educated and informed about it. Um, I know that um, it's, uh, it prevents wildlife from crossing the river, which it naturally does. It's, um, it would be detrimental, but I think the other three guys are better to answer Michael this. just unmuted. I think he's ready to weigh in. Yeah, I went down and saw it recently and <clears throat> it's quite a barrier going right across the river, uh, whether it survives floods, that'll be a interesting thing to see. But um, a lot of animals, you know, we talked about birds migrating along these riparian corridors, but we have a lot of other animals like uh, jaguars, um, ocelots. Um, some people say there might even be um, jaguarundis that come up there. But, uh, and then, you know, uh, other bigger animals just won't be able to get through uh, at the border. And we've had um, at least one jaguar in southeastern Arizona every year for the last 24 years. And some years we've had three, some years two. But uh, these jaguars travel from the south and they're, they've all been male so far. And they're trying to extend their range, uh, looking for females to breed with. And so they're trying to extend their range and come up here. And with this wall, they won't be able to do it, especially along the San Pedro River. Um, I did find once a 22 inch long turd that was an inch, <laughs> inch and a half in diameter. And uh, the hair on the back of my neck stood up and I realized I wasn't the biggest, baddest boy on the San Pedro. Uh, I gave it to the um, biologist and I found footprints that were as big as my hand is uh, five and a half inches across. So we really have some special animals that will be cut off by that border wall. There's also a ton of water use in like mixing the concrete and stuff. We actually, the center published a report about it that you can find on our website. It's called A Wall in the Wild, the, the, the disastrous impacts of the border wall on wildlife. And we can, we can post a, a link for that. Ralph, did you want to weigh in on the wall? Um, yeah, a little bit. It's, uh, it's just horrendous. I mean, the, the wall is an affront to human dignity, among other things. Uh, and in terms of the wildlife, it just stops animals in their tracks. Um, things that fly, of course, can get over the wall and get around the wall. But for a great throng of other living things, that, that, that wall is just absolutely an abiological uh, thing. It's, it's really not good. Somebody asked, um, is there a plan to dam the river or is it just the groundwater in the aquifer that, that would support the development? Are you, are, are you talking about the big NATO yeah. uh, development? Yeah. You, no, there, this, is the, this is the last of the free flowing rivers in the desert west. It's not gonna be dammed. Um, one of the key um, aspects of all desert rivers is the volatility. So it's very dry in the summer and then we have floods. And so the San Pedro, sometimes you can cross without getting your feet wet. You can jump across it, but other times it's a mile wide and it's got as much river as, or much water as the bigger rivers uh, throughout the world. So that volatility is key. Is key. The, the, the border wall is not gonna survive. There'll, there'll be a big flood that'll come through and, you know, the, the, the floodplain there is a mile wide and it's going to blow the wall out of the way. The wall was never necessary. It didn't do anything to stop people. There was no border agent that was stationed on the San Pedro ever believed that that wall had any security purposes. You know, so we have a window now within which we're going to need to address some of these issues. And I would say for folks that wanted to do something in the shortest term, let your legislators know that you know that this, uh, uh, this affront that was placed across the San Pedro uh, needs to be removed. It has no security purposes. It's just destroying a very special part of a very special place. In terms of its uh, true effects on the wildlife of the river, besides the fact that we now have a structural barrier that prevents larger uh, land animals, um, it's, it doesn't really affect the flow itself and the floods, and it won't. But we really need to remove it because it really it doesn't belong there. It should never have been built except to promote the ego of the moron that we just got rid of. Tear it down. 
So somebody has a very specific question. How many miles long is the San Pedro? And I'm going to tack onto that question. And is it just awesome and biodiverse along its entire length? The river, the river is around 165 miles from its headwaters in Sonora down to Winkleman where it joins the Gila River. Is the whole thing yeah. awesome? Is the whole thing awesome? Yeah, just like are uh, there species everywhere? Well, there, no, the, the river, it's not the same from one end to the other or from one reach to the other. There, there are reaches of the river that are perennially wet. There, there's water flowing there year round. Those places are brimming with more life than you can shake a stick at. Other parts of the river uh, remain dry most of the time other than when floods happen and that's typically during the monsoon season in summer. Uh, but even those dry reaches, you know, a lot of them still have riparian forest along both sides of the stream bed. And what that means is that the aquifer is still close enough to the surface in those areas to feed that forest and to keep it alive, but it's not quite high enough uh, to, to let the river flow. And then there are other places um, where the river is both dry and there is no forest along its banks. So it's, it varies from one place to the next. But I think what's critically important to realize is that there are these, these islands of life. It's, it's like a string of emeralds laid across the desert. I, I always tell people, if you, wanna, if you wanna understand what makes this river so special, one of the first things you should do or attempt to do is to get in a plane and get way up high and look down and see the big picture of this landscape. And I'll never forget the first time that I flew in here and I was glued to the window like I always am on any air flight. Um, but that was a really revealing moment for me. We flew over this valley and from up 15, 20,000 feet, you can see you know, literally forever. And what I saw below me was an ocean of desert. You know, it was, it's all gray and brown it looks, um, it looks dry, it looks hungry for water. And then right in that big ocean of all that, all that gray and brown desert, there's this little green string that just sticks out like an emerald in a cave. And it, it, it's a linear oasis and it's so, so, um, so rare, so precious. Um, I can't say enough about it. And in terms of the animals, uh, it is beyond measure in terms of its importance. One of the statements in the movie that just grabbed me right by the heart and crushed my heart was that the water in the San Pedro is a zero sum game, which means anytime water is taken out for a development or for whatever, an animal is like losing that water because it's so, there's so little water and there's so many animals there that that was really powerful. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember who said it, but um Robin, we've got more policy questions for you, keeping you on your toes tonight. Is there any possibility of changing Arizona law regarding wells near rivers? Don't bet on it until we have a huge political shift. Um, it's coming, um, but no time in the near future. And the reason is, is that Arizona government is still controlled basically by developers. Um, and that's why we're even even fighting projects as insane as Big Netto, uh, because they're trying to take advantage of Arizona water law. That's why we're notorious for all the water scams in the past. And, uh, you know, ironically, the, the water laws were designed, the latest of the water laws were designed to try to cut down on some of the scams. Um, but unfortunately, they've just, uh, you know, kind of sprung a million different leaks. Uh, to use a water analogy. So the short answer is no, not in the near term. It's not going to happen. Someone else asked if there's a public trust doctrine in Arizona. You know, the truth is there's really not a public dr trust doctrine anywhere in the United States yet, but there will be. Um, we just need to have, uh, you know, the next generation take over government and make sure that it's incorporated into our laws. And so it's something that we've looked at to try to, to pursue within the courts. Um, but to date, 
no one has really been successful to the point that uh, it's that we have anything but lift service paid to that legal theory. Are you all aware, are there any partnerships or groups um, in Mexico where the river originates that are working on trying to help save the river? You guys, Mike or Ralph, do you want to answer that one or? Sure, I'm, uh, I'm going to consult something here and that's a list in my book uh, because I don't know these, these, um, these groups personally. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, um, there are several of them. One is called Pro Natura in Sonora. Um, some, uh, another one is Naturalia AC. That's listed out of Mexico City. Another organization called Fondo Mexicano para la Conservación de la Naturaleza, um, FMCN for short. Another one that's just just uh, south of the border a little bit called Cuenca Los Ojos. There's a number of different Mexican groups that are that are helping to protect land and to focus on the river and other parts. Thanks, Ralph. Okay. So I want to ask you about the insects. I haven't read your book yet. Um, I did watch the film. Tell us about like the insect diversity. And one of the things that fascinated me in doing research for this webinar was learning that so the monarch butterflies in Arizona, some of them overwinter in California and some of them overwinter in Mexico. And the winds that overwinter in Mexico fly along the San Pedro as part of their, their migratory route. Yeah, um, the, the river is a big migration corridor for all kinds of life and insects are definitely in that category. Um, I know there's been some research done on butterflies using the river as a corridor for migration and monarchs do use it, but their numbers have become really low here. Um, if I see one in a given year, I consider myself lucky now. And that's in stark contrast to my boyhood when they were literally ubiquitous every summer in, in, in uh, other parts of the country. So um, the, the, insect, the insect fauna here is really diverse because there's such a diversity of habitats all the way from the high uh, tops of the Sky Island Mountains down to the bottom of the valley floor. Lots and lots of different plant communities which contribute to a real richness in the, in the insect world. And the freshwater bugs in the river too. Freshwater bugs are so cool. They look like little aliens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, ever since I've been a child, I've been, I've been peering into any body of water I can find because there is just so much life. And yeah. the San Pedro is definitely full of, of that sort of life. So Michael, what's the, you've spent so much time on the river and you've walked its whole length. Tell us like the coolest thing you've ever seen. Well, on the insect, am I on? Yes. Yeah, uh, on the insect thing, uh, I'm currently doing a video for Southwest Wings uh, Birding Nature Festival. And it's on insects. So last summer I went around and filmed in insects with my little uh, um, iPhone. And I have a little tripod and I got up real close and personal with the insects. So uh, that ought to be coming out in May. So if you really wanna find out what kind of insects we have, that's me walking along the river every week, uh, filming everything I could see. There's a lot of interesting things. It was such a dry year this last year that the numbers of insects have really gone down. And as Ralph said, the, uh, the monarchs, I don't see many of them. There's an Asclepia that the uh, mar monarchs love to be on. And there are a few Cienegas. And one of them is the threatened Cienega up there by where Vigneto is proposing uh, their development. Uh, that would suck that, um, that Cienega dry. But uh, some of the cool things I've seen uh, is I saw beaver evidence that where they climbed up in, uh, nine feet high in a tree to chew off branches. And as you know, beaver don't eat wood, they chew off the branches so that they can get it to the, the tender buds in the leaves. Uh, I also found out that um, um, Gila monsters will climb trees. Rattlesnakes will climb trees. Uh, foxes, I've seen foxes up in trees. Uh, those are some of the cool things. And of course, seeing evidence of uh, jaguar is always very interesting. And we have javelina on the river. Um, that's one of the more common creatures to see the javelina, the, the mule deer, uh, the uh, white-tailed deer, uh, the quadamundi is my favorite. And I think one of the coolest things I ever saw was somebody once had told me about it raining kawadi. And I thought, what in the hell does that mean? And I, I, I'm sorry. And I was out with my dog 
and the dog um, scared them and they all went up in the tree. And then I went to get a picture and then all these little Kawadi babies start dropping out of the trees, just like rain. Like they just free fall? Yeah, I, um, I think they just lost their nerve. You know, they were up in the tree and they were scared and they just <laughs> started falling out of the tree. Well, I would, I'd love to do a follow-up webinar in you it, with you in May of, about your insect footage. And by then we'll probably have some policy updates and lawsuit updates too. So that would be cool. Mm -hmm. we, we're winding down on time. I want to take it back to Dina just to share any um, more thoughts you have about the film or the river. Oops. Um, um, just, you know, watch the film if you haven't and um, if you like it please spread the word um, this screening is going to go on through Sunday and uh, soon after that the video will be made available publicly so um, you can watch it on sanpedrofilm.com you can also also watch it on the save the um, I'm not sure uh, just just um, yeah, just spread the word. I think the more people know about it, uh, this this the more protection this river will have, and um, that's important. Ralph, how can people get a copy of your book? Um, there's several different ways. There's a few different editions of it. Amazon.com lists my book for sale. And it's easy to find, uh, just type in the life of the San Pedro River. There is a deluxe edition of the book that is much nicer. It's printed on heavy paper and the color's a lot better. And that's an, available only from me. And you can get that on a, on a website. Um, if anybody out there wants to write this down, it's w-a-l-d-t dot square, s-q-u-a-r-e dot site. Thanks, Ralph. Michael, if people want to see your other films or videos or pictures, is that possible? Oh, absolutely. I have a site. So if you go into Google and type in San Pedro River, San Pedro River Educational, and you go to Vimeo, I have about 300 videos. I'd say maybe um, 60 of them are about the San Pedro River. You can see Huachuca Water Rumble. You can see that wet, dry, and the beaver survey and a whole bunch of other educational videos we did for the schools in the area so if you want educational resources please go to that and if anybody can't remember that please just uh, send me an email and i'll be glad to send you the link and robin's photos those are the ones that were in the slideshow at the beginning they're online at robin silver photo right right all right well we're gonna run out of time thank you so much for joining us thank you to our panelists and to naaman and griselda who are behind the scenes making the magic happen the film is available to watch through the 31st. You can find the link at savethesanpedro.org. You can also sign up for our action alerts and future webinars there. The video of this webinar will post tomorrow. Go to biologicaldiversity.org and then go to action and then go to events. And all of the previous webinar videos are on there. As always, we are so very grateful for your support because we couldn't do this work without you. So we appreciate your time this evening. Take care.